Hello and welcome. In the last video, you saw that if you want to rise in life, you must get hold of power. By hook or by crook, it doesn't matter. At the same time, it's imperative that you don't come across as power hungry. So you can't be direct and visible with your power moves. You can be unfair, but you should look fair. You can be a crook, but you should look decent. You can be a wolf, but you should look like a sheep. If you want to learn the difficult art of deception, 48 laws of power is a good start point. In the last video, we discussed the first three laws of power. In this one, we'll discuss laws 4, 5 and 6. So let's start with the fourth law of power. And here is what the fourth law says. When you are trying to impress people with words, speak less. Powerful people impress and intimidate by saying less. The more you say, the more likely you are to say something foolish. Also, keep your statements vague. Even if you are saying something common, it will seem original if you keep it vague. That is the law. And here are the stories. The first story is that of famous US diplomat Henry Kissinger. Winston Lord was a subordinate of Kissinger in the foreign office. He once worked on an important report for many days. He then sent it to Kissinger. Kissinger returned it with a short remark. Is this the best you can do? Winston worked some more, polished the report and resubmitted it. It again came back with the same curt question. Is this the best you can do? When Kissinger sent it back the third time, Winston snapped and wrote, Damn it, yes, it is the best I can do. To which Kissinger replied, Fine, then I guess I'll read it this time. By saying so little, Kissinger sowed the seeds of doubt in the minds of his subordinate. In fact, he was saying nothing. He was just asking a question. The first draft of Winston Lord's report was fantastic. Had he replied, yes, it is the best I can do, the first time itself, he wouldn't have to rewrite it twice. But he couldn't because Kissinger had asked a question which was vague. It inspired fear and doubt rather than confidence. The second story is that of King Louis XIV. He spoke so little that his silence often terrified his ministers. Whenever they wanted to submit an issue to the king for decision, they would discuss it for weeks together. After these mind-numbing discussions, they will nominate two ministers to present two sides of the issue to the king. What would the king say when the two options were presented to him? He would listen with an expressionless face and say, I shall see. Then he would walk away. The ministers would never hear another word from the king, but they would see the result weeks later when he would come to a decision and act. He would never consult them on the matter again. Louis XIV was a man of very few words. His most famous remark is, I am the state. It's short, but it says everything that he wants to say. He used, I shall see, to many requests that he received. In the end, he used silence as a weapon. An author wrote this about him. No one knew as well as him how to sell his words, his smile, even his glances. The third story is that of Nicholas I. In 1825, Nicholas became the Tsar or the supreme leader of Russia. A rebellion immediately broke out against him. Rilev was one of the top leaders of the rebellion. Nicholas crushed the rebellion brutally and sentenced Rilev to death. On the day of the execution, when Rilev was hanged, the rope broke, he fell down and he survived. Those days, such an event was seen as God's will and the man was pardoned. As Rilev got up, he smiled and said to the crowd, You see, in Russia, they don't know how to do anything properly. They don't even know how to make a rope. Anyway, a messenger went to Nicholas to give the news. The Tsar was disappointed that his enemy had survived. But the tradition demanded that he pardon Rilev. Before he signed the pardon, Nicholas asked the messenger, Did Rilev say anything after surviving? The messenger replied, Sir, he said that in Russia, we don't even know how to make a rope. Nicholas once said, In that case, Let's prove him wrong. He tore up the pardon. The next day, relay was hanged again. This time, the rope did not break. Moral of relay's story is this. 
Keep your words under tight control. Once they are out, you can't take them back. In particular, be extremely careful when you are saying something controversial and sarcastic. It might give you satisfaction now, but you might have to pay a heavy price in future. When it comes to personal experience, my good friend Kapil had the privilege of working with a boss who was a master of this technique. Let's call this boss Ajay. From the stories my friend told me, I can tell you that Ajay was Louis XIV of the corporate world. Let's recreate a few questions that Ajay was asked by his employees at different times and how he responded. Employee A. Sir, are we going to open an office in Delhi next year? Ajay, it depends on two things, operational strategy and HR strategy. We'll see how these two things play out. Employee B, sir, now that COVID is over, are we going to return to office? Ajay, it will depend on five levers. We will weigh those levers and take a decision. Let's see how the situation unfolds. Employee C, sir, shall we get a salary hike this year? Ajay, you know our EBITDA has gone, grown at a healthy rate. The burn has gone down, but still net profit is down. We are still analyzing the situation. Isn't that beautiful? Non-communication at its best. Whatever action he takes in future, Ajay can never be wrong. He is the master of having his cake and eating it too. He might open an office in Delhi or he might not. He might decide to return to office after COVID or he might not. He might give you a salary hike or he might not. Everything is vague and open-ended. As a side note, Kapil told me that Ajay had no confusion when the question was about his own salary. He will forget strategy and livers and say loudly and clearly that he should get a 20% hike and 10,000 shares as stock options. In the end, the crux of the fourth law is that Power is a game of appearances. When you say less, you appear more powerful than you are. Your silence makes people uncomfortable and fearful and doubtful, just like the ministers of Louis XIV. So that was the fourth law of power. When you are trying to impress people with words, speak less and speak vaguely. Before we discuss the fifth law, a humble request. Please subscribe, like and share. It's a new channel, friends. Need your help to make it work. Thank you. Great. So coming now to the fifth law, it says, reputation is the foundation of power. Through reputation, you can intimidate and win. Guard your reputation at any cost. Apart from protecting your own reputation, learn to destroy the reputation of your enemies. Then stand aside and let public opinion hang them. This is the law and here are the stories. In the ancient Chinese court of the Wai Kingdom, there was a man named Mi Tzu. Mi had a reputation of being supremely polite and gracious. He was the king's blue-eyed man. The king loved his horses. He had made a law that if anyone rides his horse carriage without his permission, he will have his feet cut off. One day, Mi Tzu's mother fell ill. He used the royal coach to visit her without the king's permission. When the king found out, he said, How great is Mi Tzu. He loves his mother so much. For her, he forgot that he was committing a serious crime and could be punished. Another day, two of them were taking a walk in an orchard. Mi Tzu picked up an apple. After eating half of it, he gave the other, other half to the king. The king said, You love me so much. The apple is so delicious, but instead of enjoying it yourself, you gave it to me. Later, however, people in the court poisoned the ears of the king. They told him that Mi Tzu had become very arrogant. They were able to destroy his reputation. Now the king saw the same actions in a new light. He had the audacity to use my carriage without my permission. How dare he give me a half-eaten apple? Soon, Mi Tzu was dismissed from the court. The second story is that of General Erwin Rommel. In World War II, General Rommel was leading the German tank divisions in the deserts of North Africa. He had built such a reputation for deception that he, he was known as the Desert Fox. His very name struck terror in the minds of the enemy. 
Even when he had just a few tanks with him, the news of his approach would force people to evacuate entire towns. That is the power of reputation. It works for you silently even before you arrive at the scene or say a single word. Another amazing thing about reputation is that once it is established, it grows without any effort. Hundred years later, after he rode his tanks in the deserts of North Africa, Rommel is still known as the Desert Fox. Wikipedia page on Rommel mentioned the phrase Desert Fox as early as the second sentence. So that was General Rommel. When it comes to a personal story, I had told you about Varsha in the last video. Varsha was the HR head in the organization of my good friend Raj. She was a master of deception. Let's see how she was able to carry out this deception. The headquarter of my friend's organization is in the US. Raj told me that over time, dozens of people had filed complaints with the headquarter against Varsha. But strangely, Varsha had survived and the people complaining had been punished. In fact, Varsha had not only survived, she had flourished. Raj said that it goes against all logic and fairness. The problem is that when reputation works its magic, logic and fairness go out of the window. To her credit, Varsha had meticulously built a reputation of efficiency and honesty. Top people in the organization were convinced that she couldn't do anything wrong. They were also convinced that people complaining against her were disgruntled and must be sidelined or even fired. The genius of Varsha was not only how she was able to protect her own reputation, it was also how she was able to destroy the reputation of her opponents. When these two things combined, the effect was devastating. The force of Varsha's reputation was able to deceive an entire organization. All these stories have one theme in common, which is that reputation is a powerful force. If you are able to build a reputation of efficiency, your mistakes will be overlooked and your achievements will be magnified. If you are able to build a reputation of honesty, even your dishonest deeds will be overlooked. For the same act, another person might, might be fired, but you will be celebrated for having acted in organizational interest. Moreover, if you build a solid reputation, it will compound over time and give you great returns as it did in Varsha's case. Now the all important question is, how do you build that reputation? This is what the book suggests. It says that when, when you begin to build a reputation, focus on one outstanding quality, say honesty. Then spread the word about that quality slowly and steadily. Don't be in a hurry. Focus on laying a strong foundation. Even if you go on behaving dishonestly, talk constantly about honesty. A repetition has a mysterious power. When you say it often, people will start believing you. They will even start talking about it on your behalf. This reputation for honesty will give you the license for deception. Another important point. When creating the reputation, focus on the people above you. People below you matter, but only a little. If you have the top people in your pocket, you will be able to crush the people below you who dare to dissent. The crux of the fifth law of power is that reputation is a treasure. If you want power, you should collect this treasure carefully and then guard it with your life. It will help you intimidate your enemies and win. It is equally important that apart from protecting your own reputation, you also learn to destroy the reputation of your enemies. So that was the fifth law of power. Coming now to the sixth law, which is be seen. Stand out from the masses. If you get lost in the crowd, you will be ignored. But if you stand out, you will become a magnet of attention. This attention will give you immense power over the masses. This law has two components. The first component is the art of getting the attention of people. The quality of the attention doesn't matter. All that matters is the quantity of attention. So don't bother if you have to do something controversial or scandalous to get it. A prime example of that is Donald Trump. When he joined the race for Republican nominee in 2016, people laughed. A reality TV star, a cartoon, a failed businessman. He is all that and more. But despite that, he was able to become the most powerful man on earth. 
Come November 2024, he could regain that power. Here is a man who lies through his teeth. Here is a man who is the first US president to have been impeached twice. Here is a man who has been convicted of all kinds of crimes. Here is a man who asked his supporter to attack the parliament building after his defeat in the elections. And here is also the man who is worshipped by half the American people. After he was hit by a bullet in a recent election rally and he was being taken away, he raised his fist and uttered the word, fight. In the days that followed, he squeezed every ounce of value out of the incident. When Donald Trump acts or speaks, facts don't matter. All that matters is drama that he creates. He draws his power from the attention that he gets. Another master of getting power from attention was the famous scientist Thomas Alva Edison. Edison would design dazzling experiments to display his discovery of electricity. He would talk on, of inventions such as robots and machines that could photograph human thought. He didn't know whether any of these things were possible, but they helped him get valuable attention. In fact, Edison did everything to ensure that he got more attention than his great rival Nikola Tesla. If you compare the fame that Edison and Tesla received, you will acknowledge that Edison was a clear winner in the game of attention and power. So the first component of the sixth law of power is the attention that you are able to get. The second component is a sense of mystery. Generate a sense of mystery and secrecy around you. Keep your words vague. Keep your intentions unclear. Keep your actions unpredictable. The sense of mystery will multiply your power. That is how General Rommel multiplied his power. There were battles when British forces had five times the number of Rommel's tanks. The British forces were convinced that Rommel had no options but to withdraw. But Rommel would do the opposite. He would attack. What he lacked in force, Rommel made up by cunning, mystery and unpredictability. In the corporate, you have many options to get attention. There are a host of organizations which give awards to everyone who cares to attend their marketing events. Best admin professional, best in procurement, best HR leader and so on. Get those awards and hype them. Don't bother if 300 others got the same award along with you. People sitting in the US don't know that. Secondly, there are certifications which declare that your organization is a heaven to work in. Don't bother if the annual attrition rate in your company is 50%. Get those certifications. You will be surprised how easy these certifications are to get if you invest just a little effort and money. And mind you, getting awards and certifications is not enough. You need to hype them on the social media. Seeking attention is not an easy game, but it's very rewarding and will give you incredible power over others. So that was attention. What about mystery? The game of mystery is relatively easy. Just don't take any decision. Hold long meetings, listen to everyone and then sit tight. Ask for more data. Ask for market surveys to be carried out. Ask your people to hire a consultant. More reputed the consultant and the more money of the organization that you spend, the better. If something goes wrong, you can pin the blame on them. While you are having a ball, let people think that you are working hard to make the most difficult decisions. Let them wait and talk about which way you will go. If you take decisions on the spot, people will think the decisions are easy. If on the other hand, you prolong the process in a planned manner, you will be able to create a sense of mystery around your decision making method. It doesn't matter if you yourself don't know what that method is. So boys and girls, whether you like it or not, life is a game of power. If you want to win that game, you need to understand and practice the laws of power. Here are laws 4, 5 and 6. Law 4. When you are trying to impress people with words, speak less. Powerful people impress and intimidate by saying less. Also, speak vaguely. Even if you are saying something common, it will seem original if you keep it vague. Law 5. Reputation is the foundation of power. Through reputation, you can intimidate and win. Guard your reputation and also learn to destroy the reputation of your enemies. Law 6. Be seen. 
Stand out from the masses. If you get lost in the crowd, you will be ignored. But if you stand out, you will become a magnet of attention. Until next time, take care and be powerful.